Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of American cultural history. We've talked about a number of examples of high culture and low culture in the Gilded Age, the decades following the Civil War. In this final lecture in this section, we're going to talk about a few more examples of what some scholars have described as amusing the millions, mass entertainment and culture in the decades leading up to the turn of the century. In this case, we'll be talking about World's Fairs and amusement parks. By the end of the 19th century, it was possible to host massive entertainment spectacles like World's Fairs and to develop things like amusement parks. The railroads moved large quantities of people, supplies, and equipment all over the country. Electricity was crucial because now things could be done safely at night and we could perform in well-lit large venues. Technology was critical for the evolution of World's Fairs and amusement parks in this era. One of the most prominent was the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, which brought millions of people from all over the world to the middle part of the United States. It was, in some ways, the country's welcome to the world stage and it was a spectacular display. One of the highlights of the fair was a colossal Ferris wheel that was one of the wonders of the age at that time. Eleven years later, the World's Fair returned again to the United States Midwest, this time at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, which was also called the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. In commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase and the voyage of Lewis and Clark, the St. Louis World's Fair looked to the West and across the Pacific much more than its 1893 counterpart in Chicago. Remember that between these two World's Fairs, the United States won the Spanish-American War and assumed colonies. Featured at the 1904 World's Fair were displays depicting and often involving live subjects from Pacific Islands such as Hawaii and the Philippines, among many others. St. Louis organizers hoped to outdo the spectacular success of the Chicago World's Fair, and in many cases they copied or mimicked popular features from Chicago. In fact, they reconstructed the very same Ferris wheel as had been featured so prominently in Chicago. The fair covered some 1,200 acres, included more than 1,500 buildings, and 75 miles of roads and walkways. Chicago had the Midway. St. Louis had the Pike, a similar strand of concessions and amusements. Most controversial, the St. Louis fair featured large displays of people of many races, these were intentionally framed to portray such people as primitive. As a final note of interest, the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair also included the Olympics, the first time the Olympics was staged in the United States. Of course, it was very different from the Olympics of today and spread out over a period of many months. Most controversial were the so-called Anthropology Days, a series of events pitting top athletes against the aboriginal peoples displayed at the World's Fair. Victories of the top, of course, white Euro-American athletes were then used to symbolize the superiority of the white race. While horrifically racist by today's standards, at that time such racism was customary and accepted. Some entrepreneurs sought to capture the popularity and whimsy of the massive World's Fairs by creating permanent fixtures in cities around the country, amusement parks. Horace Bigelow was one of the innovators in amusement parks. He was a self-made man. He had started as a shoe salesman. He invested, bought real estate, and ultimately built a fortune. He was descended from Puritans and himself a God-fearing man who honored the Sabbath faithfully. But he also sympathized with the common man and laborer, for most of whom Sunday was their only day off. Despite his personal beliefs, he began to open his amusements to the public on Sunday. He began building amusement arenas, 
smaller than bona fide amusement parks, but a similar idea. By 1905, he opened a full-scale amusement park, Bigelow's Gardens, in Worcester, Massachusetts. By that time, there were already several other such parks in other cities. But Bigelow is groundbreaking in that he originated the idea of opening the parks on Sunday, and thereafter, Sunday became a day for the masses of workers to flood to such entertainments. The centerpiece of amusement park entertainment was Coney Island, which began as a seashore retreat for the upper crust at the southern edge of Brooklyn. By the 1880s, it had become a must-see spot for visitors and travelers, and was becoming a popular weekend getaway for the hordes of New York's workers. The railroad transformed it in that era, as now hundreds of thousands of people could afford both the time and the cost to travel the few dozen miles it might take to get there. It featured hotels, boardwalks, carousels, racetracks, games, rides, carnival food, and all the other features of an amusement park. The crowds at Coney Island reached 100,000 on some Sundays as, quote, New York moved down to the sea. The rise of Coney Island and other amusement parks is a direct result of the movements I described earlier. As workers became more organized and slowly to improve their condition in the late 19th century, they had the time and the means to partake of such entertainment. A banner from one strike in 1889 sums it up well. Eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. That what we will included things like amusement parks. By this time, the wealthier classes were making an effort to separate themselves from the working class hordes. They had other entertainments, like posh sporting clubs, yacht clubs, and retreats, and we'll talk about some of those in future lectures. But Coney Island was for the masses. Frederick Thompson was an amusement inventor. Born in 1873, he spent his youth in Midwestern steel cities. It was an unfocused youth. He was loath to grow up and sought to hang on to his childhood pleasures. He came to believe that play could be marketed. He decided to become an inventor and constructor of shows. In 1901, he helped to design the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. In 1903, Thompson opened his prized showpiece, the Luna Park Amusement Park at Coney Island. There were already two lesser amusement parks at Coney Island, but Luna Park was the masterpiece. For 10 cents admission, attendees could roam the grounds without limits, visiting the gardens, circus acts, animals, shows, rides, food, and everything else. It was designed in Oriental style, and is considered by many the first theme park. On its first 4th of July, 142,000 customers visited Luna Park. Thompson marketed his park to the middle class, white-collar workers, good, clean family entertainment, a place to avoid the rowdier crowd. In 1904, another park opened at Coney Island, Dreamland. It featured longer rides, in some cases slower rides, huge towers, wild beasts, and was intended to be largely educational. We might make a rough comparison between Epcot and traditional Disney World. While there was a great competition between the two, and for that matter, the other two parks as well, it was becoming clear that there was foot traffic enough for them all. By 1910, with four full amusement parks, Coney Island was the best representation of the nation's evolving mass culture. By 1910, there were over 400 amusement parks in the United States. Including fairgrounds and resorts, the number was more than 2,000. Attendance was strong, many parks drawing several million visitors each year. Workers found the parks liberating and fun, encouraged them to take a holiday from their normal lives. The entertainments also took them outside their social norms. Some of the games featured throwing at glass plates, marketed as, you can't break them at home, break them here. Another popular ride was the Barrel of Fun, where people bumped into each other, sometimes hugging inadvertently. 
Roller coasters were advertised with posters saying, Will she scream and hold on to you? There were also hints of sexuality, though the parks never approached the risque acts of burlesque. At one park, a popular spot blew air up the skirts of unsuspecting women. At first embarrassed, many of them would then stop and watch other women step through the spot and laugh at their embarrassment. Outside the parks at Coney Island, the streets were lined with vaudeville and burlesque theaters, dance halls, roulette games, rides, and public beaches. The parks also sometimes reflected some of the bigotry of the day. Political correctness was not an issue at that time. They featured odd people, overly tall, short, fat, hairy, and so on. Some games were outright racist, sometimes involving hitting a target to send a black man into the pool of water. There were also dodgeball-type games in which contestants could aim at targets who represented various minorities. Still, there was also a sense of community at the parks, millions of people mingling together outside of the restrictions of normal life. Women had more freedom at the parks. They could find the different, the exciting, the unexpected. At the parks, economic and class status blurred. And yet, there were those who objected to this world of amusement parks and entertainments, those who thought the blurring of social lines and the sometimes risque misbehavior it involved were unacceptable. Many of these were the progressive reformers of the age. It is to that that we will turn in our next lecture.